is the one who satisfies us, and he satisfies us completely. And uh, although it seems like this is all there is, there's a lot more. Hold on to your hats. <laughs> right on. All right, for those of you that uh, have been journeying um, here with us in God's Word these last uh, several weeks, we're in John chapter 6, the Gospel of John chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 6. Um, we're following Jesus through his early days of ministry as recorded by the Apostle John, who was an eyewitness. And by the way, that was a qualification for an apostle to see the Lord personally with their own eyes. But we begin to see a pattern in Jesus' life and ministry, one that is public, touching the multitudes, and one that is private, expressing his devotion to his Father and teaching the Twelve. So Jesus' main mission, what was it? It was to present himself to the Jewish nation. He went, came to the Jews first as their Messiah and eventually to the greater Gentile populations. He did this by actually telling them that he was the fulfillment of prophecy, that he was the prophet that Moses spoke of that would be raised up like Moses um, and all the other scriptures that prophesied Messiah. Um, so he did this by telling them, but he also did it by showing them who he was. He'd just done this by feeding an estimated 20,000 people. The Bible says 5,000 men. Um, and then when the crowd rose up after that miracle and healings that he was performing as well. They rose up to make him a king, and he retreated to the mountains to get away from it. He directed his disciples to go ahead of him to Capernaum. And so that's what they did. You remember last week that they headed out in the boat. They were buffeted by uh, a storm coming down from the, the mountains and uh, caused them to struggle and to row hard to get out of that. Jesus saw them in their struggle, and he came to them and assuaged their fears with just one word. He says, hey, it's me. Don't be afraid. And so we saw last week that, that Jesus, God, sees us in our personal struggle. You remember that? That's one of his names. The names of God is El Roy, the God who sees. He spoke that, was given that name uh, back in Genesis when he, he spoke to uh, Hagar, who had had a confrontation and, and gone out and, and uh, the angel of the Lord comes to her and says, hey, you know, go back and, and uh, go through this because God's going to bless you as well. And uh, the Lord himself declared his name as El Roy, the God who sees. The God who sees that servant girl who was kicked to the curb and he sees those uh, servants of the Lord rowing hard in the, the storm and he is the God who sees us. Hallelujah. Um, it says that they gladly received him into the boat and immediately they were at the, their destination, which was on the other shore near to the synagogue in Capernaum. And you can go there today. It's called the, the White Synagogue because a lot of the stones were made out of like alabaster. There's still the floors all right there and some columns. So let's pick it up in uh, chapter 22, I'm sorry, in verse 22 of chapter 6. Here we go. John chapter 6, beginning in verse 22. 
And we're going to read up through uh, 35. Lord, we thank you for your word. Your word is manna to our spirit man. We invite your Holy Spirit to come and to teach us this morning. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 6, verse 22. On the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except the one which his disciples had entered, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Verse 27, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. Therefore, they said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, verse 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Praise the Lord. So the crowd had witnessed Jesus' healings and feeding of thousands, and they saw that he was not around, even though the disciples had left and they got into boats. Everybody got into boats and they followed. They also came from a nearby town, Tiberias. You know, they've got these little village towns. Tiberias is a, bi a big city now. Uh, when they heard that he was going over to Capernaum, they followed. So we get to verse, verse 25, and it says there in 25, uh, they, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? <laughs> in other words, what's up, Jesus? We saw what you did over there on the other side and experienced that whole thing, and you just take off and leave and you don't even tell us? They addressed him respectfully, rabbi, teacher. But Jesus puts all the pleasantries aside, and he doesn't go into a dialogue and say, oh, well, you know, I just uh, uh, didn't think that it was necessary to talk to you guys, and, and besides, I'd already told the disciples I was coming over here. He just cuts right to the core, to the heart of the matter. And he, he says, <laughs> he says, most assuredly, I say to you, verse 26, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were feel, uh, filled. So he confronts them with their true motive. And that's what he does with us. He looks at our motives. You know, there's times when we do things and we just may feel like we're motivated by ritual or just by a convention or uh, because we, we have to, um, out of obligation or tradition. 
But he confronts us and brings conviction of our of sin into our our awareness. He he says, "Oh, is that really the reason you wanted to do that or help that person?" There was some personal gain there, wasn't it? What is your real motive? You know, it's important for us to see that God sees our hearts and our true motives. And he wants us to see those as well so that we can be transparent with him and real with people and transparent with people. Psalms 139, turn with me there. That's one of, the, one of my favorite passages. Uh, Psalms 139, I'm sorry. Verses 23 and, and 24. Psalm 139, verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there's any wicked in, way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So we are going to share the Lord's Supper in just a little bit. Let that be our prayer. Lord, search me and know my heart. See if there's anything there that you want to put your finger on. You know, he's, he's gentle, but he's also firm. There's things that God wants to uh, show us in our lives to move us forward in uh, being conformed into the image of Christ. Amen? So we go on there, verse 27, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you because God has set his seal on him. Once that Jesus had exposed their true motives in seeking him, he says, hey, you guys just want to be fed. <laughs> why, do, why do we want to follow Jesus? You know, it's just for what we can get from him. You know, he's got a lot of good stuff, right? He's got peace and joy, contentment. I mean, is, is that the only reason that we pursue him? He got their attention, was able to draw them deeper, and then delivers the deeper essence of his message. The good news. It's good that they were following him. You know, it's going to draw them deeper. He's basically saying, set your eyes on eternity and not just this materialistic world. Seek spiritual food first and foremost. For this food will last forever forever. And I am the one who can give it to you. In fact, I am that food. Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. Flip with me back to Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Numbers, Deuteronomy. Chapter 8, verse 3. Deuteronomy 8, 3. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor your fathers did not know, that he might make you to know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. It's a very familiar passage. The Jews had manna to eat. Why? Because God commanded it. Therefore, it was not actually the bread that had kept them alive, but it was God's word creating that manna that kept them alive. You remember when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness? And uh, he, he said, uh, Satan came to him and said, hey, turn these, uh, these stones into bread. After fasting for 40 days, that was a big temptation. But Jesus responded to Satan's temptation with, by quoting Deuteronomy 8.3, which we just read.
He emphasized that God himself is more important to sustenance than food. Does this mean that we don't have to work to provide for our needs? No. You know, we're told we got to weigh Scripture with Scripture, and we got to take in the whole Word of God as to what it says, you know. It, it says clearly in the, the New Testament that we are to labor with our hands, that we can have enough for ourselves and to those that are in need. You know, and if, if a man does not work, neither let him eat. You know, it's, it's very strong. But we are to put spiritual things first, not to put our work first. It's like Anthony said in his, his message to the children. We off in our culture, in our society, we worship our work. Everything that we see and experience here in the physical is based or built upon the spiritual. This is why Jesus taught in several places that, you remember, he told his disciples, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. For he who asks shall receive, and he who seeks shall find. And him who knocks, the door shall be opened unto him. Uh, in chapter 6 of Matthew, turn with me there, Matthew 6, verse 31. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew 6, verse 31. Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be added unto you. Hallelujah. You know, we are to seek first the kingdom of God. First and foremost, in our lives, you know, as Anthony said, we wouldn't even have our breath unless God gave it to us. Let's ask him, you know, how he wants us to use that breath and for his greater glory. Christ alone can satisfy the hunger of the human heart and soul. In the ancient world, it was the seal that authenticated any commercial or political document. The kings could fix their seals in wax or clay. And uh, this is why Jesus can satisfy our spiritual hunger. He's the king of kings. He has been sealed by God the Father. Now, there was an interesting thing that was uh, spoken by John the Baptist back in John chapter 3, verse 34. Turn with me there. John chapter 3, about being sealed. John 3, verse 34. John is giving uh, his testimony, he says in verse 34, For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God does not give the Spirit by measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. Oh, I'm sorry. It's back in, uh, in verse 31 and 32. He who comes from above is above all, and he who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. Verse 32 of John chapter 3, and what he has seen and heard that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. That's the word I was looking for. John is saying that he who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. That word certified means he is sealed by God, as John the Baptist testified. His works testified that he was sealed by God. His father testified, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And Moses testified that 
God would send a, raise up a prophet like unto him. Jesus is God's truth incarnate, and it is God alone who can truly satisfy the hungry soul which he created. When we yield to him and embrace his truth, we receive eternal life, as I read there. We are now marked and sealed by God's spirit. Just as Jesus was sealed, we are sealed. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. If you bring your Bibles, you will be engaged and you will become more familiar with your Bible. Like I am right now. Where's Ephesians? <laughs> it's, it's right after... <laughs> Galatians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, right? Okay, Ephesians chapter 1 and verses thir- in verse 13. Ephesians 1, 13. So that <laughs> I'm in Philippians. Okay. Ephesians 1, 13. In whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, having believed, You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Hallelujah! You've been sealed by the Spirit of God. And you are going to be redeemed. That means you've been purchased. Okay, you're a purchased possession. And uh, God knows those who are his. Amen? Now, Sheila just made that journey, and, and uh, she, she had been sealed by God as a child of God through faith in his son. So, those who know the truth have received and yielded to the truth. We are now privileged and responsible to what? Walk in that truth. Loving others, right? Love does. Love is an action. I like the sign in front of the Catholic Church in Javi. It says, uh, you know, uh, um, I can't quote it exactly, exactly, but it 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 conveys that thought that you know, uh, love without action is meaningless. So do not labor for the food which perishes. Okay. Verse 28, and they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? This is such a uh, important part in the dialogue that he is having. What must we do? The Jews immediately thought that Jesus was saying God required them to do some good works to earn everlasting life, and they wanted that list. What what do we do to do the good works? That was a good thing to ask and a step in the right direction. Let's not fail to notice that Jesus is leading them into deeper truth in a very gentle and progressive way and yet direct way. It was their conviction that a man could earn favor by, from God or with God by living a good life. They held that men could be divided into three classes. Those who were good, those who were bad or evil, and those who were in between. And the in-betweeners, if they just were able to do one more good work, they might be transferred into the good category. So when they asked him about the work of God, they expected him to lay down a list of things to do. Actually, they already had the list. The Mosaic Law, which no man has ever been able to perfectly Obey.
But Jesus Christ came as the mediator of a new and a better covenant because he was able to obey and fulfill the law completely. Hallelujah! This is the basis of our covenant relationship, not based on works, but on faith. Hallelujah. You know, the book of Hebrews is, is often subtitled, uh, you know, the book of better promises because we have, a, we have a, a better sacrifice. We have a better mediator. We have uh, better hope. You know, all of it is better, you know, better possession in heaven, a better country, a better resurrection. I love the book of Hebrews. This points to the better covenant that was consecrated through the broken body and the shed blood of our Savior. So Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in whom he sent. This verse is crystal clear. The only work God desires requires uh, that he requires is faith, belief in him and his son. This is not the first time that Jesus had said this, going back to his earlier encounters with Nicodemus and the unbelief of, of, of Nicodemus, the woman at the well, the noble man, the paralytic. He revealed himself as the Savior. He said, you must be born again. Then in his address to the leaders after healing the paralytic on the Sabbath and emphasizing his equality with God in power and authority, he said in John chapter 5, turn with me there, just flip back to the previous chapter, John 5, verse 22. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Verse 24, most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my words and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Believe in God the Father. Believe in His Son. And you have the gift of eternal life. But it all comes down to faith. Who can quote with me Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9? It's important for us to revisit these passages so that we can hide them in our hearts. For by grace are we saved through faith and that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, lest any man should boast. Hallelujah. So, it says in this verse that even the faith that we have is a gift from God. And we're going to read later, no man can come to the Father unless the, the Lord draws him. Even faith is a gift from God, lest we should boast about it, because guess what? That is what we would do. Oh, yeah. I did that. Verse 30. Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform that we may see it and believe in you? What will, work will you do? Jesus had just made a great claim, a claim to be the Messiah. And that the true work of God was to believe it. Believe in me and you will have everlasting life. Their response was, okay, if you're the guy, prove it. <laughs> How could they ask for more proof after having witnessed the healing of the paralytic and others along with the feeding of the multitude? The blindness, the hardness of their hearts which would continue throughout Jesus' ministry, even to the point of denying Lazarus' resurrection. Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. 
And after his resurrection, they determined that they would kill Lazarus and they would kill Jesus. Because of their jealousy. Even at the cross, they mocked him and chided, if you are the Messiah, come down, then we'll believe you. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 12, 38 and 39, you can look at that later, an evil and an adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Jesus told Thomas, who said, I'm not going to believe it unless I see it. He said, Thomas, because you've seen, you believe. Blessed are those who believe and have not seen. Verse 31, our fathers ate the manna in the desert as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Since Jesus had produced bread for a mere fifteen to 20,000 people and claimed to be the one who would provide food that would last forever, the Jewish leaders pointed to Moses' experience with the Israelites in the, minute, in the wilderness. He said, Moses gave us manna, and he fed millions of people, an estimated, you know, 1.5 to 2 million people. Can you do that, Jesus? Manna had always been regarded as the bread of God. And there was a strong rabbinic belief that when the Messiah came, he would again give the manna. The giving of the manna was considered to be the supreme work of, in the life of Moses. And the Messiah would surpass it. They had a saying, as the first redeemer caused manna to fall from heaven, even so the second redeemer shall cause the manna to fall. It was the belief that the pot of manna, which was placed in the Ark of the Covenant, remember that? In the first temple, that when the temple was destroyed, Jeremiah had grabbed the pot and hidden it away and it would produce it again when the Messiah came. In other words, the Jews were challenging Jesus to produce the bread of God, to substantiate his claims. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven, verse 33, and gives life to the world. Jesus' response was twofold. First, he reminded them that it was not Moses who gave them the manna, it was God. Secondly, he told them that the manna was not really the true bread of God. It was only a symbol. The true bread of God was he who came down from heaven and satisfied not simply man's physical hunger, but spiritual hunger. Jesus was again saying that spiritual hunger could never be satisfied, could only, I'm sorry, could only be satisfied in him. Verse 34, then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. The blindness of the crowd and their leaders reveals they still had not understood that faith in Jesus was the bread of life. Verse 35, and Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus brings clarification. That he was referring to himself. He says, I am the bread of life. 23 times in this gospel, Jesus declares that he is the great I am. This is God's name as the account of the burning bush reveals in uh, the first half of chapter 3 of Exodus. You can go there, reference that yourself. You know, the burning bush and, and uh, you know, gets Moses' attention and he says, I want you to go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Oh, who do, you, who do I say send me? Tell them, I am, that I am is sending you. Okay? Uh, this name for God points and emphasizes to his self-existence and his eternality. He was never created. He always will be. He is the self existent God. I am the one who is and, and will be. The 
text continues in, in, uh, in Exodus chapter 3. He says, Say to the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has sent you. He reemphasizes he's the same God throughout the ages. He's the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Without beginning or ending, he's self-existent. In Hebrew, the, the word for God's name, I am who I am, is Yahweh. Maybe I pronounced it wrong, but basically that's it. It was considered so sacred that it was unpronounceable. You should not even pronounce that name. And so the Masoretes, uh these scholars, inserted the vowels from Adonai, which means Lord, to create Jehovah. Instead of saying Yahweh. Technically, this combination of consonants and, and these vowels is called the Tetragrammaton. The name of God. The Tetragrammaton. So here, in this passage, we have the first of seven metaphors using the tetragrammaton, I am. He says, I am the bread of life. Later on, we will see that he says, I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. This is all in the Gospel of John. Won't you come to the creator of the universe? Won't you come to Jesus? He is all he claims to be. He is the Messiah. He is God. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And you shall find rest unto your souls. Today, you can find complete rest in Him, confessing your need, your, your sin, and finding forgiveness and acceptance and healing from the only one who is able to grant it. The living God who made you, knows you, and loves you. He's waiting for you to turn to Him. Now, if you ask the common man, May I ask you a personal question? Most people will say yes. Some will say it depends on how personal. But may I ask you a personal question? In your opinion, how does someone get to heaven? And 95% of those that respond will say, well, you've got you've to gotta be good enough to get into heaven. The Bible doesn't teach this. The Bible says that there's no one good, no, not one. And that it's only by grace through the final atoning work of the Messiah that we can go to heaven. He's waiting for you to come to that place where you acknowledge that there's nothing good, not enough good that you can do to earn the favor of God. Believe in His Son, the bread that came down from heaven. Hallelujah. The hunger of the human soul is ended when we surrender and come to know Christ as Savior and through Him to know God our Father as Abba, our Daddy. The restless soul is at rest. The hungry heart is satisfied. No searching of the human mind nor longing of the human heart can fully find God apart from Jesus. He offers himself to us as the bread of life. Will you receive and accept that offer or reject it? Will you enter into this relationship of peace and satisfaction? Will you enter the haven of rest, safe from the storms of this world and the world to come? The offer of Christ is a new spiritual life now and for all eternity. That is the greatness and the glory of which we cheat ourselves when we refuse his invitation. 
Lord, we thank you for what you have done. You've done it. You've done it all. And we just bow before you. And we confess our need, Lord. We just come to you. The only one who can satisfy us. And we bow before you. Lord, we invite you to have your way with us this morning. Search our hearts. See if there be any wicked thing there. God, cleanse us of our sin. Father, as we remember the price that was paid, may you wash us anew. May you bring us to that place of recommitment. And if there be anyone here that is making that commitment for the first time, I pray, Father, that you would you would bless them as they lay their burden down and receive the bread that you provide. Lord, have your way with us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. the elements are here please take come uh, as you're led and just uh, take it back to your seat and then we'll uh, we'll receive it together that same evening as Jesus approached the cross, He took the bread and he broke it and he said, this body, this bread is my body broken for you. Take and eat. In the same manner also, when the third cup, the cup of redemption, was being passed there at that Passover meal, that Seder, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you do, eat this bread and drink this cup. You remember my death until I come again. Take and drink. You can just hold on to your cups. You can put them uh, on the side and uh, down by the leg of your chair or whatever. And we'll come and get them eventually. But um, worship team, can you come forward? We're going to uh, do the final song. So Titus chapter 2 verse 11 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed, and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Uh, Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together, God, that we could feast upon the bread of life, Lord. And now as we, we, uh, we, we eat together, we thank you, Father, for the, the hands that have prepared food. Please bless them. Thank you, Father. Bless this food to our bodies, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.